Welcome, everybody, to No Driving Gloves. Hope you enjoyed the rerun episode last week. All of us decided to take the 4th of July off and not do anything and kind of sit back and relax. Hopefully that was good for you. You know, played that early, early episode, and I thought the sound quality was good. And the, the topic was interesting. And like I said, we'll probably revisit uh, Tesla within the next few weeks or months. Uh, they seem to have a little bit of influence on the car world. We got Derek on the other side of this microphone tonight. How are you doing tonight, Derek? I'm I'm doing pretty good. I'm I'm just very quiet sitting here trying to figure out um, taking off Fourth of July because yeah, I still worked. I mean, I didn't do no driving gloves, but it's not like I was sitting around home like you were, John. If you knew the amount of work I I, I had Fourth of July week, um, it it's. It's a little overwhelming right now. I'm working on a, a different project I've alluded to uh, many times and still focusing on my visions and vehicles and uh, trying to get some cars sorted for various auctions and that for some clients. I really don't like doing that kind of work. I'm not a broker, but it's part of the service of the uh, private clients service stuff that I do that these I've got a couple that are rotating some collection pieces and We've got to figure out how to maximize our dollars, and it's been a it of an adventure. All right, moving right along. Yeah, I'm kind of at a break <laughs> in the. <laughs> <laughs> what do you get? Anything interesting going on there, John? Any, uh, you know, anything you can talk about? No, I I really can't talk about <laughs> about a lot of what I do. Maybe if we get a couple of cars on. Uh, bring a trailer or something on the 10-day the or 14-day program that they're doing now. We'll bring some up. I do know some of the stuff that's coming up on there and the negotiations there and then working with some of the auction houses. And It's amazing as you talk to people and uh, I tell people on the street that I'm doing this and all the auction advice that you get. I think we've touched on that in some of the auction episodes and I'm not going to go down those roads tonight. Have you done anything interesting, Derek? I know you've been thinking about playing some car swapping and moving some automobiles and, I would say, adjusting your private collection. The night we are recording this, prior, just prior to kind of coming on, on air, if you will, I was looking at a... I'm not going to talk too much about it, I think, because uh, I'm not really decided yet, but teens-era Chevrolet touring car. So thinking, thinking about that and... Maybe moving some things around, as you say, in the collection and um, probably focusing more on on the earlier cars uh, other than uh, still searching for that just right Corvette. I'm currently looking at the uh, 70, well, let's say 68 to 73 third generation Corvette probably being the, the one that I'll uh, try to secure first, so been keeping an eye on those and you know everybody's yeah. been trying to buy those the last 20 years well we don't need to talk about that <laughs> speaking of the the third generation of corvettes I actually had a great day at work yesterday i guess it was sorry the days are running together but we're preparing for our 25th anniversary at the museum of course and i think i may have mentioned that once or twice on the show general motors you know heritage center we had Manta Ray delivered um, yesterday to the museum, one of the design studio concept cars uh, that led to the third generation Corvette design. Pretty, pretty fantastic car. And uh, it'll be at the museum here for a few months uh, celebrating the 25th anniversary. Kind of exciting there. I'm going to go on and maybe Derek's going to shoot me for saying this, but if you put a car up for sale on any of the websites, Facebook Marketplace, eBay, Hemmings, you name it, respond to the people that reach out to you. Tell them it's... Oh, yeah, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> tell them it's not available. Tell them you're, you know, I'm selling it for a drug deal. I don't care what, but please don't waste our time. <laughs> uh, I think both Derek and I have recently chased some things down that, we're not well, no, there. You can't say you, you can't say we chased them down because we never got an answer. We just chased them. <laughs> yes, that, that's very true. 
And, you know, I try to be very respectful when I'm buying off of these websites and let the people know exactly what I'm doing and where I'm going to be and when I'm selling on. And, you know, I try not to ghost people or whatever, but just please take that into consideration if for for those of you out there. I know most of our No Driving Gloves listeners are better people than that, but remind your um, not so, you know, high class friends that please, please respond. Tell us no. We we can accept rejection sometimes. Yeah, you know, your shady loser friends. Yeah, those guys. Sorry, was that a little too low? I, I apologize. Ah, uh, but aren't we supposed to be honest to have that no no or that gloves off approach to the collector car uh, yes. hobby? So yeah, be a little bit mean. Yes, unless we're dealing with museum artifact vehicles, then we still wear our gloves. Just that point. Sorry. Uh, depending what museum you're at, I, I've been in some pretty large museums that can't figure out why you would use gloves. It's just better, you know, go ahead and wipe off the fingerprints and grease. And I'm gonna jump into the, our. our topic of discussion we you know we kind of said we're taking the fourth of july week off but there was a very impactful event this week and it related to a topic that i've had on our board to do, to reach out and discuss and i'm referring to the passing of you know lee iacocca and on our topic board i wanted to discuss automotive icons Normally on no, no Driving Gloves, we don't discuss or even mention any icon that is passed. Um, we know you're going to hear about it elsewhere, your, your automotive fans. But I've with Lee's passing, it was interesting. Not even my, it was my Facebook feed and you know, social media feeds are all about him passing away. And it's from people that aren't car people and people where he impacted their lives or people remembering the K cars or their Pintos or their Mustangs or their minivans. And I think even on our minivan, our, our Facebook page, I put the Viper out there. People forget that he was involved with the Viper. Uh, you know, he was always an icon to me. He was important to me. You know, that's kind of my little he passed away. But. What Derek and I are going to do, and let Derek, if he has any opinions on Iacocca there, but we'll probably touch on him later because we're going to visit what we feel are some of the most influential automotive icons dealing with the car companies and that over history. Derek, do you have anything or any opinions on Iacocca? I mean, and even if they're bad, because I do have some negative things to say about the man, too. You know, with, with good comes bad. Yeah, I mean, you're definitely more of the, you know, Chrysler guy, which is where he made a lot of his impact. Uh, I mean, you can't pass up the time he spent at Ford and, and the Mustang and, um, you know, the work he did there. But as for someone who you know, was in the industry, leading the industry for such a long time, he played a vital role for a very long time really saw the industry through quite a big change you know things were done in the american auto industry uh, you know moving into things like the k car and the minivans from basically gas monster machines i mean i I feel he was a very significant figure and did a lot of good things for the industry. So I think we've talked about uh, Bob Lutz on the show before. I know we're probably going to get Bob. Now. People know I, you know, being a, a, a GM guy, uh, you are a, a fan of General Motors and, and someone who grew up in a General Motors family. You know, there are... I have negative things to say about Bob Lutz. I have some good things to say about him. But, you know, I, I, I think Iacocca was kind of a, a game changer in a lot of ways. Well, let's jump back to the beginning of time. And we're going to, we had to narrow this down a little bit because there's a lot of big players. And I think we've talked about the history of the automobile before and went back as far as Da Vinci. We're keeping it to American icons, those that were influential 
the real catalyst of this topic was an article I had read about Elon Musk. We'll get to him in the at the end. Uh, maybe Derek's going to disagree with me, but one of the big players and, and the true icon, really the guy that put America on wheels, is Henry Ford. Uh, we've had a lot of discussions, talked about the Model Ts. We had a really good episode where we discussed Ford and would have Fo- would have Ford survived without Ford. And we really went into the depth and the impact that Henry Ford had on the automobile industry. And if you get a chance, go back and listen to that episode if you missed it the first time around. We threw out a lot of things, a lot of stuff that people didn't realize. And I was actually on LinkedIn this week chatting with a Ford dealer in the country where they were talking. The article was written wrong where his dad had started a hardware store in 1904 and became a started selling Model T's in 1904 and and I kind of pointed out that oh, that's impossible. <laughs> or was or was he one of the really really early Ford dealers? Because if he was, I was going to try to get that family on the show to you know if they were selling Fords before the Model T. But he became a Ford dealer in '14, and you know we had a little conversation about Ford son, Louis Chevrolet and Dodge Brothers, and it was really uh, our Fronty, not Ford son. What am I thinking? You know, I, I just think. You can never have a discussion, and, you know, Henry Ford set the mold. He put cars on four wheels. He kind of came up with, I want to say, the modern automotive driving style, but if anybody's driven a Model T, we know he was a very late adopter to the left-hand drive and kind of (laughs) H-pattern shifting. Derek being a Ford guy. Uh, kind of a Ford guy and from the Henry Ford at one point in your career. Do you think we're right? I agree with your Henry Ford, (laughs) Uh, your, your Henry Ford statements. And, you know, it's not that I disagree that he's an icon, but I I think there's another Henry that gets often overlooked and left out in kind of being an, an icon and someone who should be remembered as an icon. And that's Henry Leland. We've we've had a show discussing the connection between Leland and Ford in the past and that whole messed up history. But, you know, Henry Leland is the man that comes in, takes one of Ford's companies, turns it into Cadillac, yada, 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 keep going. But what Henry Leland does, his experience from the arms industry, guns, you know, firearms, is he had learned about standardizing parts, standardizing components that make a product. He's really the first automotive, American automotive uh, kind of leader that realizes if we're going to build cars at a, a, you know, mass, more mass rate, we need parts and components that are going to be able to interchange in the automobile. So we don't have to worry about every time we grab one and slip it in. And if it doesn't fit, we got to file it and move it here, move it there. If you make everything exactly the same as, as close as possible, the same as you can, as people like Browning and and others did in the, the firearms industry, you're going to be able to build those vehicles easier, quicker, and get them out the door. To me, that is just as important as what Henry Ford did, if not even more important, because because without the idea of standardization, standardization of parts and components, how in the world? Now, a little technical difficulty there. Derek's uh, internet connection dropped. So we've got him now back on the phone trying to get a reliable connection. You heard a little bit of breaking up from him earlier in that. Uh, just, I don't know, weather challenges, uh, Kentucky Whatever, but we've got Derek. I blame it on Kentucky. Yeah, well, we've got Derek back, and he was on a wonderful discussion and about standardized parts and that. So hopefully he, he forgive him if he double talks a little bit. But we're just going to pick it up right there and uh, go on with our story. Yeah. So I, I'm not really sure, like I say, where where we broke up, but uh, you know the point I was trying to get at was. Uh, Without Henry Leland bringing these ideas over, bringing standardized parts into the automotive world and kind of leading that charge, other companies wouldn't have been able to make the steps they made, including Ford Motor Company, in mass producing the automobile 
and you know putting it on an assembly line and bringing you know bringing the car to the masses the way Henry Ford did and that was all because of Leland's thinking and background and experience in another industry like firearms i guess those are very good points and you know without one you couldn't have had the other we've got the two henrys to begin this where would you like to so we're going to go Leland, we're going to go Ford. Another one of these automotive icons, say, at that turn of the century that we really need to throw in, because these were all cutting edge, do it my way or the highway type people. These were all, I mean, it was a, a crazy industry, lots of money being thrown around, people investing in a lot of ideas. You know, we had various electric cars. We had the gas gasoline cars. We were fighting to, you know, some people wanted to keep the horses, just like today we want to keep the manual transmissions. But they were, you know, trying to keep the horse. Who, who's an, uh, another one of these good icons that had an, a lasting impact on the automobile industry? If I had to go with another early kind of leader, that I would say is iconic. Um, I think you have to look at Alfred P. Sloan. Not necessarily, in my opinion, business or automotive genius, but business genius. But business genius that led to shaping, really, I mean, shaping the American automobile industry in a way that we are still to this day dealing with. Uh, Sloan, I mean, this is the beginning of, of the idea of corporation, a conglomerate of multiple companies you can't really say the word monopolize because you know there were other companies out there ford chrysler you know the dodge brothers i mean as we all know early early in the auto industry there were thousands of car companies even if they were just little startups that made four cars this is a man who brings together the largest american automobile company and runs it in such a unique way. I mean, we still have General Motors Corporation today. And, you know, he was bringing in all of these companies under one brand so that he would have, you know, basically cars for every price point. I guess, as you stated, that's kind of the game we play. We're going to get into a little of that in a... And an episode coming up in two or three weeks, it's going to be the next big topic that we discuss. And the, uh, you know, Sloan created the move from Chevrolet to, I can't remember, Buick, then Oldsmobile, or Oldsmobile, then Buick, and eventually arriving at Cadillac, and everybody wanted to have a Cadillac. But I want to, get, you know, the, like I said, a future episode within the next couple of weeks will be the one where is there a desirable achievable car. I mean, there's always the dreams. I mean, when the Cadillac was the dream car, there were still Duesenbergs. You know, there was still the supercar. I think you're right. Sloan created that, and that model has lived for decades. I don't know if that model still exists today, but that's the model all the manufacturers are set up for, and that's even, you know, going outside, you know, the country. You know, you can go to Volkswagen and, you know, you have Volkswagen all the way up to Bentley and Bugatti. So he laid, you're right, he laid that in, in, in place. And would we have this massive Volkswagen conglomerate? Uh, at one point, Ford went ahead and had their premier division with uh, Land Rover and Jaguar to even be above uh, Lincoln. Yeah, well, and and I think we should clarify, and I I feel I should clarify that Sloan was the man that really made that successful because you have to remember that, and I'm I'm sure we've talked about it on one of the early episodes we talked about, you know, Durant, William uh, Durant, Billy Durant, is the man that really starts that idea. Of, of bringing General Motors into those multiple companies all under one kind of holding company. But Durant has a, I don't, Durant did a lot, but uh, it's really Sloan that takes what Durant had created um, or started creating and really 
as you say, manages it as a business that is so successful. So I think that's where I look at Alfred P. Sloan as kind of iconic over Billy Durant. I can kind of agree with you there. Kind of. I'm sure there's other two, <laughs> but that's okay. That's why we're here. So are we still going to play around in the teens? Do we have somebody that? I don't think so. I mean, I think that's those are the big, big things that come out of that time period. Those are the icons from there. And then we we move on. And I want to jump, and maybe I'm wrong, jumping 20 years into the future, 15 years into the future here. But uh, would we not throw E.L. Cord into this mix? Iconic design, bringing styling, uh, uh, starting the styling of the automobile. Jump, jump to Earl in a bit, but I, th- I think uh, E.L. Cord. Well, say, you're, you're, well yeah, I mean, you got to remember, Earl starts the designing the automobiles at GM. He's really the first to create a styling studio in the country in 1928. I don't think he radically changed styles. I mean, if you look at the four Cord 810 and 812, uh, or e- even the the Auburn 833 Boattail Speedster, those seem to be a little bit pushing that cutting edge of the the fender, or, you know, the integrated fenders, and obviously the cord with the the hidden headlights. I think he start. I think Cord started to push the styling a little bit more than what Earl was doing at the time. But I think well, what I think what I'll give you that because because I and I will admit Earl, you know, Earl's coming into a major automotive manufacturer, you know, 1927, 28. And it is true. E.L. Cord actually starts the styling of Auburn's in 1924. He takes unsold 23s convert some of the sheet metal to a stylized uh, body line and, you know, sells a stylized Auburn, which is what essentially saves the Auburn company from going under. I I will credit that there. Credit where credit's due. I don't know. And where I'm saying that I think E.L. Cord, don't, don't get me wrong. Earl is definitely a player in this conversation, but I don't know it without E.L. Cord would have Earl been able to do what he did would have he been you know he fought for what he had you know did the gm brass just didn't say oh yeah go ahead and do what what you want mr earl they you know he had to fight for what he did but i think the fact that cord was pushing that envelope kind of gave a little bit of the green light to earl that hey maybe my thinking's not crazy he's kind you know it's a proof of concept i guess is what i'm going for is E.L. Core did the proof of concept on stylizing automobiles, and Harley Earl perfected it. He took that proof of concept and built his design studio at GM and built some cutting-edge automobiles with timeless styling, some controversial styling, but he definitely made an impact, and he's he's the guy that took us away from the cars of the teens and the twenties look to the more rounded flowing cars of the thirties and forties. And then as we move into the fifties um, with the, the kind of a little bit more radical changes. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll agree with that. Uh, you know, I, and I, I, I don't disagree that E.L. Cord is someone that needs to be recognized in this class of people. It is an interesting time where you've got E.L. Cord and Harley Earl doing the things they're doing. I mean, it's initially when, you know, as, as we're going through the show, uh, Cord probably didn't pop into my head, but now that you say it, you know, as I say, I don't disagree. Yeah, and I'm going to kind of spin off of the Harley Earl E.L. Cord that Cord gave that proof of concept to Earl to go ahead the next guy I'm going to throw out there is and because it's about we're trying to do this, I guess, maybe in a time fashion. And if you, you know somebody before this gentleman, Derek, correct me and we'll delay it. But I'm going to jump into Preston Tucker. He was ahead of his time for what he, he did. You know, the rear engine automobile, the safety zones, trying to build a safer car. 
he he was really pushing an envelope and going places that none of the major manufacturers wanted to go. And whether or not you believe how Tucker failed, whether it was him being shady and, you know, playing the shell game with money and very, you know, the 50 cars he built, or if the manufacturers really crushed him, I think... I think he brought safety to light and brought it to the table for conversation going forward with the the big three, maybe the big four, big five at that point in time, however you want to look at it. And he also, I think, s- proved that the little guy doesn't have a chance anymore. Or you, you need to be very well funded and very well connected to think you even have a chance because with the exception of two other people that I can think of, nobody's really made made any inroads into creating a new car company. Yeah, uh, and I would agree with that. I think Tucker is one who gets a lot of notoriety for the, as you, 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 you mentioned earlier, self-promotion. Um, Tucker was a self-promoter. It was the way he knew to get people involved in what he was doing. It was a way to really try to get the company off the ground and attempt to make it be successful. Uh, you know, and and I would yes yeah, say he's definitely one of one of uh, an iconic uh, you know list of people. And another one that I think gets you know looked over as as I mentioned before, although I don't know that I would list him as I iconic necessarily but along the lines of of what tucker was doing you know i I would at least tip a hat to bill stout of the stout scarab and uh, the stout y46 concept car and really what was originally the stout tri-motor instead of the ford tri because stout was looking at a lot of the things that tucker brought more attention to um, after the war, uh, Stout was doing it before World War II, but he never really reached that iconic status, I think. Yeah, and I think that plays back to what we discussed a little bit with Henry Ford and Henry Leland, is Stout was the practical guy that didn't necessarily go out and do that celebrity thing and push and, you know, the the Stout Scarab is a you know, fascinating automobile, even though we're going to pro- eventually give credit to Iacocca for the minivan, maybe in a surprising way, but I think we'll eventually give him credit. Stout did that, you know, the, the Scarab was a minivan when it really came mm-hmm. down to it with, you know, movable furniture inside and, you know, room to, it was very adaptable. So he was on that forefront, but he unfortunately kind of played in the background and wasn't that commanding presence that I think the people I'm thinking of for this list did. Um, But I'm I'm not going to say you're wrong, Derek. I just, you know, and unfortunately, he's another one of those that just didn't know how to market his personal brand, as we, you know, I guess we say in, you know, this social media influencer world we live in now. He just couldn't do that. Where... Tucker was good at it, good at it, and we're not here to judge Tucker. Go watch the movie, go read a book, and make your judgments on him whether or not you think he was run out of business or, you know, he was just poorly, poorly funded and maybe he could have survived with more money. I'll let you go on from, uh, I think we're at four, in 1949. Who do you think is going to be the next guy that comes into play? Yikes! That's. <laughs> I think we. I think it's a big jump. Well, okay. So are we? So here's my question. Uh, yeah, we've kind of been jumping around a little bit. Are we going? Can we go outside the automobile industry specifically, and but have ties to the automobile? No, because I don't think they're classified as auto icons. If we sat down and watched a history, history Channel show, they're not going to get mentioned. And that's kind of what Are you I'm sure thinking. about that? Because I'll throw a name out if you can't think of who I'm thinking of from the late 50s, early 60s, 
that I think might be considered an icon. I'm going to say you can, but then I probably have two or three names that I could throw in that go ahead. Hey, it's your show, too. Would we consider Ralph Nader? He had a massive impact on the industry. Um, I probably will give you Ralph Nader. And I'm trying to think if he's the next guy, though. And I might go with that. Now, I want to think Henry Ford II played a pivotal role, but I don't think he was an icon. I think some of the decisions he made really affected the industry, but I don't think he was necessarily an icon. I have to give you Nader. That, that's a good one because he changed, he changed a lot of thinking, technically ruined a brand. Yeah, in many ways. I mean, and... You know, he is also uh, you. If you kind of look back to the tie to Tucker, Tucker was there. You know, uh, yeah, he was trying to create his own automobile, but he was trying to create an automobile around safety, and he was pushed under by the big guys. How many years later is that? Thirteen, fourteen years later. Well, Tucker would have been uh, forty-nine. Nader would have been sixty-two or sixty-three. So. Yeah, I mean, so we're talking, you know, fifteen years. So somewhere in there, here comes this lawyer out of nowhere, all of a sudden is saying the same things Preston Tucker was saying, takes on a massive corporation based on safety claims. And basically, as you say, you know, runs a, basically completely runs one model of that car company into the ground, which was actually a pretty cool car overall but wasn't the, you know wasn't the corvair actually a brand it wasn't the chevrolet corvair or anything if i remember correctly it was the corvair that is an excellent question john i don't remember i thought by the end it was the chevrolet corvair but you may be right that at the beginning it was only known as the corvair can we air quote that company it's kind of like the edsel <laughs> or the <laughs> Continental. Uh, well, well, although I have a friend that would kill me if he heard this podcast and I said that we should put Continental in air air quotes because no, Con Continental uh, was its yeah. own brand. Etzel was its own brand. Now, Wikipedia says the Chevrolet Corvair, a compact car produced by General Motors from 1960 to 1969. But this is Wikipedia. Let me go in and change that. Then I'll be right. <laughs> <laughs> well, either way, whether it's yeah, you know, whether the intention was to have it be its own brand or it was just a yeah. model, I still lean towards model. Um, but it 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 um, warrants some research. Um, we we forgot but, we forgot one, and it's one. What? And I I'm somebody before Nader, and it's somebody. Oh, okay, back up. And it's somebody you shouldn't forget. Well, I mean, are we still on design? Do we want to talk about Bill Mitchell? Uh, Mitchell would be a big one, but I was thinking Zora. Dun okay, well, there's Zora. <laughs> you know, Zora Duntoff, he, he kind of saved the Corvette, probably launched sports car, you know, really launched sports cars in America. Yes, we had the MGs in that. But without him, the Corvette would have died. Look at the car world surrounding the Corvette over the years. You know, I'm not going to can't spend a bunch of time on him, but I think he was an influential icon. That I can. Do you want me to? Uh, you got another <laughs> hour? Um, no, you're right. I mean, you are 100 percent right, and and you know this probably shows to our listeners that. I'm not just a Corvette guy. And, you know, I mean, the fact that I jumped from Tucker to Nader, uh, you know, my mindset was on one direction and I wasn't going that way. But uh, Zora is probably a legendary icon. I don't think there's probably about that. He's a legendary icon. As you say, it stems from I don't know that he is an icon that necessarily had an impact on the entire industry as a whole, but I think he is an icon that had an impact on a single model in a way that no one else probably has. Just in the fact that he saved the car from sure failure, 
uh, you know, by promoting the V8 and promoting the V8 for the first two years. And then when Ford finally came out with a two seat V8 powered car called the Thunderbird, Zora finally got his chance to prove what he could do. And he put the V8 in a Corvette and made the Corvette something totally different than what it had been in the previous two years. It was still a, a decent sports car for 1953 and 54. I mean, there was nothing else like it really on American roads. But when you threw that V8 in there and did a little work on the handling, that car became something no other American car company could even come close to competing with. And it created a legacy and a you know following of a car that you know made the car an iconic status you know there's there's very few cars that probably live up to that and in those cars that live up to that there's very few that have a single person behind them that made them that way and that's where that's why i threw them out there is you even said it in in your little explanation there if it wasn't for the corvette ford would have never done the thunderbird and if it wasn't for zora what would a Ford done with the Thunderbird? Would have they continued the two seat? Would the Thunderbird have went away? Was Zora's actions with the Corvette what pushed Ford to go to the the four seater Thunderbird for the second generation car? I think there's a little bit more outside influence than what I think you realize. I think it, the tentacles are very fine, but they get out there, and I would be hard pressed to say there's another single model. There are brands, but I don't know if there's a single model of a car anywhere in the world that has the following of the Corvette. Exactly. That went out that we went back to Zora, and I guess we could throw, you know, Bill Mitchell, Ed Cole, and those guys from the 50s, but Mitch Mitchell had a lot of, <laughs> I guess, a lot of impact for the, you know, after. Yeah, and Mitchell's impact really comes later after Harley leaves, and, and he really takes over, and not, isn't just Harley's right-hand guy, but rather he's the guy. So after Nader, who do we land on? Well, let's see. Ralph Nader takes us into the essentially early 60s and really changes the idea of safety in American automobiles. And so we move into the the mid, let's call it the mid 1960s. And I think this is someone in the the pre show that you know John, I think you kind of brought up and you know has a major impact. Unless you want to save him for the eight, early 80s. Well, I think there's a couple of people that are going to get at this point. This is how iconic they are. They had influences at different points in time to the automotive industry because you know we're we're talking 64 here and you yep. you're you're talking uh John DeLorean and what he did with Pontiac in the creation of the GTO and a whole genre yep. at the same time just in, as big of an icon and somebody who's kind of remembered a little bit more fondly Lee Iacocca with the Mustang you know, he gets a lot of credit for the Mustang and the way it looks. But to be honest, when Derek and I met, Derek was displaying a car in the museum I was at that was the original Mustang that looked nothing like the other car he was displaying, which was Mustang um, 001, or I can't remember. Was it 001, or was it the first Mustang yeah. sold to the public? I can't remember. Serial number one. So I was, I was there with Mustang 1, the concept car, which in all reality, was a true sports car, a two-seater. By the time they move into producing Mustang, they created the Mustang II concept car and then moved to the production version. It had become you know, what we have referred to affectionately as the pony car, you know, more of a four-seat car, but not quite to the level of John DeLorean and the GTO of a, a hardcore muscle car. And I'm going to throw a plug in here. If you haven't spent your six bucks on Amazon or Hulu or whatever, watch the movie Framing John DeLorean. It's not the best presentation of DeLorean, but it's very honest and I think depicts the man pretty good. Production quality could be a lot better. I beg Chassis Media and Adam Carolla's company 
to do this documentary. They do would do a such such a much better job at it. It kind of shows you some of the arrogance that the companies have, and then what these icons actually had to go through to get their ideas through. You know, De- DeLorean brought us the GTO, but the only way he brought the, us the GTO is understanding and taking advantage of a loophole in General Motors hierarchy that, you know, they didn't realize. And by the time they realized it, it was too late. You know, Ford was, or excuse me, Iacocca was playing along with Ford. And, you know, I don't know how much he really had to do with the Mustang, but he's known as the father of the Mustang. And there's there's win one for DeLorean. There's win one for Iacocca. Yeah, and that's and that, I mean we're talking the beginning of their careers at this point. Yeah, Iacocca would have been late thirties, early forties, because I think he was thirty six in sixty. So well, I guess I could do yeah. the math back from today, but you know he was in his late thirties, early forties when he's making these moves, and DeLorean was pretty much the same. Yeah. And okay, beginning of the career, not quite right, but right. Yeah. let's call it beginning of their you know iconic moves in their career, and they have another thirty years ahead of them. Yes, you know twenty and thirty years ahead of them of making huge decisions that impact the industry. And so, who do we move into as the next influencer, or do we stay with Iacocca because now we get to his failure with the Pinto? Or somehow he's blamed for the Pinto, and I always say the Pinto would have never happened had we had the the accountants and bean counters we do now. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because the well, fl- I mean, but do we want to glance over you know people like say Carol Shelby in the 1960s, or do we want to look at them as, especially Carol Shelby as someone with oddly with impact in the industry. Someone you wouldn't think to have an impact, kind of like maybe like Nader in this case. Someone who just comes out of nowhere and really kind of changes the face of some things, you know, at Ford Motor Company and truly because of the at the basically failure of General Motors to see an opportunity. I threw Shelby out in the pre-show and the discussions into this show. I kind of excluded him because he's really not a man, wasn't really a big manufacturer. Shelby did have a, a major impact, but I think it's more on the racing side. You can't have a conversation about Ford in the 60s without Shelby. I'll be honest, as we were dealing with some of our technical issues, I was reading an article on the 05 to 06 Ford GTs. That car would never exist without Shelby coming on and making the original Ford GT successful. We would have, he would have never had the Ford would have never had their Le Mans wins. Who knows where Ferrari and Porsche would be today without Ford coming in and changing the game? You know, the Cobra being the icon that it is, and you know, there's only what a thousand Cobras in the world, but everybody who was a car person in the 60s, has a story about the Cobra. I think you have to give it to Shelby that not only was he there in the 60s and worked alongside of Iacocca in the Mustang and that, he was there in the 80s and worked alongside of Iacocca and the K-Car body stuff that he did. And then he was there early 2000s working with Ford again and producing his own cars and in 99 even tried to build you know the Shelby series 1 so there's no denying that i think carol shelby has to be included in that list we've got the mid 60s covered a lot of lot of has a lot of happenings there i guess those young guys from who were born around world war 2 were beginning to make themselves known yeah i can't imagine they'd be baby boomers hmm. yeah. <laughs> i mean so we got through let's call it the mid to late 60s we all know the seventies kind of sucked uh, in the American auto industry. Well, I'm going to throw. So, <laughs> I've, I've got to do something in the seventies, though, and it relates again to Iacocca and not the Pinto. In the seventies, Iacocca was pitching a vehicle to Ford Motor Company, and it might have been one of the reasons that Henry Ford II fired him. 
And there's where Henry Ford II becomes a big player in the automotive industry. If he would have never fired Iacocca, what would the car landscape look like after 1978? Ford actually had on their design tables by the 70s the minivan, but Henry Ford wouldn't let it go ahead. And we'll find out six or seven years later, that might have been a mistake. Maybe 78, 79 wasn't the time to launch the minivan. 1984 sure as heck was. And that's after Iacocca did his 1980 moves with Chrysler and, you know, putting the company on the line and he created not only an influence in the automotive industry, he created an influence in the business world. Iacocca, he was that celebrity. His salary was well known. He made a buck, you know, for a, f- a few years. Then he made $20 million when he was, and he was the highest paid CEO at the time. And, you know, now it's a, it's a sin to talk about super high paid CEOs, but I think in 84, 85, he was making $20 million a year with Chrysler. Did the TV commercials, he, you know, put his name and he put it out there and he took a lot of risks with Chrysler. One of his bolder statements and, you know, what got him the loans are the loan guarantees. Everybody thinks they're federal loans, but the federal government just guaranteed the loans that private banks gave Chrysler to bail him out, $1.5 billion. He just basically, you know, when he was dealing with the UAW on that is, I have... X number of jobs at this rate, I have zero jobs at the rate you're asking for. You make the decision. And that was his negotiation style. And he was he was this lovable little chubby guy, but he was also a down to earth businessman who stood his ground. We've got that portion of the early eighties covered and now we jump over now we jump over one hundred I 100% have to agree with you. I think as we started this, uh, you know, conversation out so long ago with our technical issues, you know, I want to I want to mention to people if John mentioned that Ford, you know, hit Lee Iacocca's time there, that there was an idea for a minivan Iacocca had put on the table. If I recall correctly, and in case people want to look this up, that was if I recall correctly, it was called the Carousel, correct? I believe that's the correct name. Yes. So if you want to look up that van, that kind of part of minivan history, it would be the Ford Carousel. You know, just because I, I, you know, I find that story interesting. Maybe some of our listeners would like to learn a little bit more about that. I I would like to throw out one. I kind of like these, you know, off the chart, weird icons of the American automotive industry in the 1970s. Can, can we, can we throw OPEC in there after all they, did kind of create the gas crunch. Okay, let's not go there. I was going to say, no, That's that, that'll really make the podcast long. That's an outside influence. And if we want to get into outside influences, now, then we got to go back. <laughs> Start. Oh, over. yeah. Oh, so. yeah. Okay, so the 1970s and 80s are covered. <laughs> it's amazing this 1984 guy, or 1964 guy, and this 1964 guy are popular in the early 80s because, you know, DeLorean went on to create his iconic car, whether or not you believe he was trafficking drugs or trying to make money or whatever the manipulation was, the DeLorean is a, became an icon. I'm going to probably go to the same question Derek asked about Nader. Would DeLorean be an icon without the outside influence of Back to the Future? DeLorean himself even thanked Roger Zemeckis saying, no, we don't want a refrigerator as a time machine. We want a car, and then slipping in the DeLorean. That probably made John DeLorean 10 times the automotive influence that he would have ever been with that movie and the ensuing three movies. So why I don't think he's an automotive icon, I think Zemeckis needs credit for creating an automotive icon that kind of needs remembered. And when you really get into the DeLorean and the DeLorean scandal and the ensuing life, you'll find out it had a lot of outside impact to other car manuals. Well, I'm not going to go there and we're not going to make it a thingy on well, DeLorean. I, I, but, uh, and okay, we, we can give Zemeckis some, some credit here. I think, again, that's an outside force, much like you know, we just talked about it with OPEC and so many other things. I will say that I, I almost think 
you know, DeLorean was already well known for the GTO, the Pontiac GTO. He he was a legend in General Motors history. Father of the GTO, the man who essentially creates a muscle the muscle car craze in America. You know, and yes, he he leaves GM, all the history there, you know, goes off to build what he thinks is, you know, the future of the automobile, you know, especially the future of a, a sports car automobile, goes off to Ireland to do it. So we're not, you know, necessarily talking American car here, but it, it's truly built for the American market. Kind of shocking way in which he builds the car, the ideas he has behind, you know, the engineering of the car, the appearance of the car, all of the things he does. I think even without the movie, the car itself and and DeLorean would have carried on iconic status because I think as people know that that listen to the podcast, you know, prior to my job uh, at the Corvette Museum, I was the curator at the Crawford Auto Aviation Museum in Cleveland, Ohio. John DeLorean's brother was a Cadillac dealer in Cleveland, in the Cleveland area, DeLorean Cadillac. People on almost a daily basis at the Crawford, I would get people coming in and looking at vehicles, and the, the Crawford has the essentially serial number one. There's there's a story behind that. And the first one actually wasn't up to DeLorean standards, so they crushed it, and the second one actually became the first one. But anyway... On a regular basis, people would come into the Crawford, say, I remember driving by DeLorean Cadillac, and and DeLorean Cadillac became one of the distributing dealerships in the United States for the DeLorean. People said, I remember driving by the dealership just to look at the rows of DeLoreans parked in back waiting to be shipped because they were so unique looking and so crazy looking it was an attraction in cleveland for people to go drive by the dealership to see these cars because they hadn't seen anything like them so i think that in its own right would have made it iconic uh, the car and delorean iconic without the movie in my opinion i don't know where to go from there as you did say a lot and had a lot of good great points there on how he got there and what he did. and Well, I mean, from there, you have to go on to the only next logical person in the automotive industry, American automotive industry, that you and I have similar and probably dissimilar views on, who created another kind of, or at least allowed another uniquely styled and kind of out there sports car to come onto the market. I think we're... We're definitely talking about the same person. I'm not going to necessarily give him the credit for putting the car on the market or designing the car because it was still under Iacocca's influence that the car was created and shown. It was in the very last stages of Iacocca's influence. But am I talking about the right guy? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and yes, I'm I'm not crediting him for the design or anything like that, but... He was really the man that sees it becomes successful. Yes. Can we put it that way? Yep. And it also highlights one of Iacocca's probably biggest mistakes. Um, And I think Iacocca even admitted to it later in life. And that was making... Bob Eaton, chairman of Chrysler, as opposed to Robert Lutz. Both those guys can be influential. Eaton's going to be the the reason Chrysler sold the, excuse me, Chrysler merged with Daimler. Lutz being a powerful GM guy and then coming over to Chrysler, or did it go the other way around? Was he at Chrysler and then go to GM? I can't remember. Wait, who? Sorry. I'm thinking Lutz. Lutz was at GM, went to Chrysler, and then went back to GM, didn't he? Uh, yes, I believe that's the way his career went. Yes. The car we're speaking about is the Dodge Viper, which is a car that n- never <laughs> should have, in any logical accountant's office, should have never been built. You know, it's a car that I think I've expressed a passion for personally, but Lutz is really that 
that person. He was with General Motors for many years, but I don't think he had an in influence or impact with General Motors at that point. Not as much as he did at Chrysler at the very end of uh, Iacocca's tenure and during Eaton's tenure. Of course, when Lutz went back to General Motors in more of a consulting type role, or I can't re I, I really forgot what Lutz did with General Motors again, but... Well, let's, you know, let's, let's not forget. I, I just wanted to double check, so I Googled it real quick. You know, he, he starts out with GM and actually winds up at Ford for a bit, then on to Chrysler, then back to Ford, or back to uh, GM. I just popped into Google, too. Auto executive Bob Lutz said, listening to Lee. I, I saw that genius. as well. I was going to leave that <laughs> out. But, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, yes, <laughs> I, you know, he does, but, you know. Uh, yeah, ends up as vice yes. chairman. And I mean, really, Motors, he, so. you know, at, at, at General Motors, you know, after he's been involved at Chrysler with the Viper and the whole situation with Lee Iacocca and Bob Eaton and everything that's going on there, he, he moves back over to GM. And, and really, I think there is where he, in some ways, hits a stride in kind of impacting vehicles. You know, he brings things like, and, and this is where people know that I have issues, <laughs> you know, he turns brings the GTO back, but kind of ruins it by just bringing a Men uh, Holden Monero over and shoving a Corvette engine in it. Although I would still own one. I'm not saying I wouldn't own one, just have my issues with it coming back in that GTO coming back in that way. You know, brings out the Pontiac Solstice and Saturn Sky as kind of a throwback to the early Corvette, the 53, 54, 55 Corvettes, really small two-seat sports car, brings in some high-performance ideas with the, you know, the Cadillac, uh, what was high CTS, CTSs and the CTSVs, the, the Pontiac G8s, you know, trying to save Pontiac, concept of the Cadillac 16, giving a rebirth almost to the Chevy Camaro. So he does a lot in, in his time at gm there's kind of that iconic status there and and then let's throw back to the fact too that in my opinion here and if bob listens to the show you know i'm, I'm sorry that i disagree with some things but and i'm i'm sorry if you, you take this the wrong way but bob is kind of like going back to preston tucker and some of those guys he was a great self-promoter he's excellent at that just to go back, I clicked to read the whole headline. Auto executive Bob Lutz said listening to Lee Iacocca was dangerous. He could make the illogical seem logical. Mm, that's what this show is all about. What I find amazing is you listed off all these cars that Lutz had influence on. The Viper, the Pontiac GTO, the G8, the Solstice, the Cadillac 16, the CTSVs. He's also was very pro Mm -hmm. Chevrolet Volt. He was also kind of supportive of the EV1. As much as he's this V10, blow it away sports car V8 guy, he's also thinking ahead for the automotive industry. I learned that. I've lis listened to all three of Lutz's books, uh, Icons and Idiots, and I can't remember all of his books. If you want some good r reading or good listening do uh, look at some of Bob Lutz's books. He's He's been able to do things and manipulate things, and he understood things from... He came from, like a lot of these guys, he came from nothing. He didn't ever mold to the corporate structure. And I think he... I want to say he probably got some of that from Iacocca in that, in that he wanted it his way, and he did it his way, and procedures be danged. And I think that's a common factor with just about every single one of these people we've talked about is my way. I said it earlier, and it's the old cliche, my way or the highway. And they stood for it. Some of them got fired for it. Some of them took risks for it. Some of them, you know, had their lives crushed because of it. But they all stood for what they believe in. Where do we go from Lutz, Derek? Well, Lutz, I mean, really brings us up quite a ways. I mean, we're we're now looking at the current, kind of in, in a lot of ways, the current auto industry, who is influential at this point. I'm, I'm trying to think. I mean, 
probably my next kind of leaving Lutz and, and another influential kind of move, in my opinion, would be Alan Mulally. Where were you at? Are we going back to General Motors to Sloan? Not necessarily a car guy, because if I remember right, Lully, Mulally Boeing, came exactly. from uh, Boeing. He's not a car guy. He's a business guy. I'll have to give it to you that he should be remembered in the car world because of what he saw coming, what his Boeing experience brought to Ford. And no, because airlines do this all the time. They all declare bankruptcy. And he knew how to position Ford so they looked good. And they were the only one of the big three that didn't have to take a bailout because of his, to me, his business sense. Is that what you're thinking of as him being uh, impactful yeah, to the automotive no, that's industry? Exactly it, you know, and, and in some ways, you could give Bill Ford, the current Bill Ford, William Ford, some credit in seeing what was coming and bringing Alan Mulally in, Bill Ford stepping down, bringing Mulally in to make sure Ford was going to be positioned the way they needed to be positioned with someone who knew how to do that, that kept the company uh, and, and I mean, really took a risk in leading the company in the way he did, not declaring the bankruptcy, pushing Ford Motor Company through, yes, having to get rid of Mercury, but saving the company without going through a whole mess of a bankruptcy, you know, bailout loans, everything that the other companies had to go through and really wound up positioning Ford in a pretty good place coming out of the recession and everything that happened in that 2000, you know, let's say seven, eight, nine time period. I have to give you that one. It was a very excellent move. And, you know, you said you know, he lost Mercury in the, you know, with what he did. GM lost, what, three divisions, four divisions? Pontiac, Olds, uh, Saturn's gone. Who else can we go with? Uh, Hummer. <laughs> Hummer, <laughs> thank you. But, and, and to be honest, Chrysler lost the company. You know? <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, they lost everything. You know, they became brands of another company and that very well could have happened to Ford and don't I think Ford was close but because they structured and retooled and refinanced and did all the debt while they could and or his knowledge of how to play bankruptcy and I'll say even with if you're doing a personal bankruptcy hire the best bankruptcy lawyer you know the question I I've heard before is you go to somebody who's does billing or deals in collections and you go, what bankruptcy lawyer would you hire? They'll tell you the best guy that's kind of take, you know, stuck them for the most money. And that's kind of what they did with Malali is they brought in a guy that knew how to structure the company to avoid that bankruptcy. He's very unusual as an automotive icon, but he can be remembered for what he did in saving Ford. So who were you thinking of? I think the last guy on the list is the crazy man that's out there right now. And people say he's crazy, but he's no different than Henry Ford or Leland or Durant back in the, the 20s. And that's Musk. He definitely has had an impact on the automotive industry. He's made electric cars acceptable. You know, GM did it with the EV1 in the late 90s, but it was a toy. It was a experiment. And who knows where that would have went without Musk coming up with the Tesla and, you know, sticking batteries in a Lotus. And everybody thought that was crazy and that would be a one-off thing. And, you know, now he's produced his sexy lineup of cars. I'm not saying sexy is sexy. I'm saying sexy is in the Model S, the Model 3, the Model X, and the Model Y. That was his goal is to have that kind of acronym. He's very controversial. He, I don't know if he's going to be in it for the long term. Everybody keeps saying he needs to sell out to another manufacturer. I think he has days of reckoning ahead of him as Porsche and Audi and Mercedes 
start introducing their competitors for his Model S. But you know what? Porsche, Mercedes, and Audi wouldn't be introducing those competitors if it wasn't for the Model S and Musk believing in what he's doing. I don't know if he's doing it to make a buck or he's doing it to change the world or change the industry. If he's doing it to make a buck, I don't know. If he's doing it to change the world and the industry, I think he did it. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you that. I think Musk is probably one of the few current uh, iconic people who will be remembered in the future for some of the ground, essentially groundbreaking work that he is supporting and and doing and ideas he has. He, He did put a Tesla in space after all. Yeah, I mean, he is. He is back, as you're saying, back back at the time of Henry Ford. When Henry Ford and the other guys were in the 1890s building their horseless carriages that they were experimenting with, everybody thought they were crazy. Everybody thought this was not going to go anywhere. You're not going to be successful. The horse and buggy and the horse and carriage and the horse are just, they're the way of life. It took people like Ford and Durant and Leland and all the people we can think of from that time period to convert one transportation industry to another. And it's going to be people like Elon Musk who are going to be the people remembered for moving, being some of those groundbreaking people in moving the industry to a new path. I'll put the disclaimer. I'm not saying the new path is electric. I'm not saying that what he's doing is what's going to stick, but he's opened the industry's eyes. He's opened the car world's eyes. He's opened really the world's eyes that our modes of transportation don't have to be gasoline powered, diesel powered, internal combustion engines. I mean, Ford, or excuse me, Toyota doesn't believe in the electric as much. You know, they have their Prius lineup, but they're very pro fuel cell and hydrogen powered. Maybe that's the way to go. I don't think Toyota could even get a grasp of it without or, or start getting people to convert that way without Musk getting people to, oh, a fully electric car works. Toyota and Honda have been playing with their, you know, dual mode hybrids for a few years since the early 2000s, but they were always thought of as a novelty car or the green person's driving them. Now, electric cars, I mean, there, there's a desire for a lot of car guys to have electric cars. Most of the supercars, I mean, Ferrari's introducing their new, their most powerful car ever, and it's a version of the 488 that has uh, electric motors on it. And it's like 900 horsepower. It has more pa- horsepower than the La Ferrari, and it's a production model. There's something to be said that I think Elon created the acceptance that cars need more batteries than that single 12 volt under the hood just to start them. Is there anybody else we want to throw on that, or do we want to give our listeners the break because we've been doing this? You know, I don't know what the exact time is with our recording but i bet you we're going to have an hour and 20 of a show this week. no i mean i think that's that and i'm and i'm sure there's people we miss there's people that deserve credit there's there always is and there always will be and you know i'm sure some of our listeners will will let us know who those people are because everybody's passionate about certain people that let's say they look up to in the industry people they have an interest in for something they did so hey we we like to hear that from our listeners we will we like the interaction we like to know what you guys are thinking i mean i th- i think for for john and i that's that's our take on it you know had had will been here he'd probably want to throw in you know somebody like chip foos or something uh, he wouldn't throw in chip foos yeah. i think but we might have heard uh, we might have heard of one or two so yeah <laughs> uh, I'm thinking like Pete Samporis, uh, you know, that did, um, I want to say Moon Eyes, but uh, SoCal Speed Shop, I mean. And, and some of those some oh, of those yeah. guys, oh, yeah. that's why we stuck it to the, you know, we, we kind of put that caveat in the beginning. American automotive kind of manufacturers. Uh, we might get, we'll, we'll get Will on here for his icon show of 
hot rods and stuff. Oh, we got to do that because I got a few for that show. Yeah. Oh, that'll yeah, be great. And I mean, that's going to throw in a few of them. And, uh, you know, I'm already thinking, oh, Louis Chevrolet. But it's, you know, <laughs> and his high performance Ford parts. You know, it's uh, Exactly. Oh, hey, we could throw another guy, Zora Arcus Duntoff. Oh, wait, we'll get into that yeah. later. <laughs> well, with that, I think Derek and I are going to say uh, goodbye. Uh, we'll talk to you later. See you next time.